I am from Jacksonville, Florida. My parents got divorced when I was 16. I lost the relationship with my mother. My dad was going through a lot too. It became a bit hostile and uh, before I even graduated high school, I was homeless. So I was 17, senior year of high school and had no home. My life was survival. I ended up getting my first sales job and came into a successful amount of money where I was like, I need to get out of Florida. This is an option, I'm gonna risk it. I picked Chicago on a whim. I had no job, no friends, no family here. I just knew I needed to get out. I paid a company to pick out my apartment and the day after my 21st, I left. It only took me a couple weeks to get my first job. I got awards for climbing the corporate ladder so fast. I plan on giving it my all for the rest of the time here. I, want to I was for a young, successful woman. My life in Chicago was, at that time, within my control, or so I thought. I was in a relationship. In my mind at the time, it was all internal dialogue, but now I look back and I believe maybe God was trying to speak to me. And the moment I sat down, I got the, the message, you might be pregnant. I came home, took the test. I remember seeing that it was positive. And at the time I had reasoned with myself, well, I'd rather lose this thing I don't know than lose my life that I love. Any girl, I would imagine, telling their boyfriend they're pregnant hopes that there's that excitement. And when I sat down and told him, he walked out of the room and came back and said, well, we have an appointment for August 28th to go ahead and just get the abortion. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. But everyone in my life agreed, get the abortion. You love your life, you're successful. How stupid would that be to have a kid right now? I wanted someone to talk to me about my options. I had only heard one option. And to be honest, that option of an abortion made the most sense. How I found the Caring Network was in that desperation of needing someone to talk to. When I walked in, I remember they came out and sat with me at a table and let me talk, let me cry. They never made me feel judged. It was not a conversation of what is right or wrong. They asked one question that I can still hear it in my head. If I told you God would provide everything and no one else mattered, would that help? Yes. Okay. Walking into their facility in those final moments of, of life or death for my daughter. And they changed everything for me. Again, by making me feel like I had a choice and I could do it on my own. Because, let me change that. I could do it with God. When she was born, I could hear her crying. And honestly, I just said, no. No, 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 I'm not ready. And they put the baby on your chest. And I remember catching her. And there's... Milliseconds. It's not just the seconds, it's the milliseconds where I open my eyes and I see my baby. For the first year of her life, I wrote her a letter every day for her to look back and see how much God carried us, how much God loves her, how much God loved me, how important it was for me to carry my faith. I wanted to know that. If I could go back to Kaylin, who just found out she was pregnant and was terrified that this life that I built for myself was going to end, I would tell myself, good. <laughs> There's a better life, more than you could ever fathom. 
you're going to have so much more. Ministries like the Caring Network help women feel loved. And in the end, what more could change a life? Well, hey, everyone. We're so glad that you joined us uh, on this uh, day after Christmas uh, time for worship and uh, to dig into God's Word and to give Him praise. And as you know, our Advent uh, focus has been to raise money and to pray for and support Caring Network, a remarkable ministry that meets women where they are and helps them facing unwanted pregnancy to choose life. And it's not too late to give toward that. Even though it's the day after Christmas, you can still give. Uh, information on how to give is available in the comment section. We encourage you, if you haven't yet maybe made a contribution, it's not too late. It will make a difference in helping the Caring Network expand into two more facilities. We're so thrilled to be able to support this ministry and pray for them and see what God does through that. Now, let's come to the Lord in prayer before we come to his word. God, thank you for the way that you poured out your blessing on us this Christmas season. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for coming into our world. Thank you for entering in and becoming one of us and living a sinless life, experiencing all of the, that we experience, the highs and the lows of humanity, and yet being perfect without sin and going to the cross in our place and giving us freedom from sin and hope for all eternity. All these things are the greatest gift in the world, and we praise you for it. And we thank you also for the gift of your word. Now open our minds and hearts as we open your word. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, today is the day after Christmas. And I don't know about you, but it's, it's a sort of a big, giant sigh of relief in some ways. Uh, it's, and it, it, all the preparations and the rush to get to this moment, and now it's somewhat in the rearview mirror. Soon we'll be taking down the tree. I don't know when you do that. Uh, maybe your tree's been up for a while and it's looking brown. Maybe it's a fake tree and you leave it up till Easter. Who knows? But soon we'll be putting that stuff away, packing up the lights, packing up the decorations, and putting it all away for another year. And very soon, this Christmas, will be like every other Christmas, a memory, something we look back on and remember. This year, uh, a number of years ago, actually, uh, I gave to my wife a special Christmas gift. I, uh, we have these uh, videotapes, uh, this will age me, uh, date me a little bit, but we had these tapes from video cameras when our kids were little. We didn't have uh, phone, uh, cameras on our phones that recorded like they do now. And we had all these little bitty cassettes from our mini recorder stacked up, which we could never watch. We didn't have a player for them. So I took all this pile of cassettes, these, these videotapes, to uh, a company that puts them all on a thumb drive and on, on DVD. And so they, we got them all by date, organized, and we spent that whole Christmas season, the year that I gave my wife this gift. You thought I gave her 100 diamond rings. It was the greatest gift. And we spent, as a family, hours just watching those videos again. And i got to tell you, as a, as a dad, hearing my kids' voices, they're all grown now, but hearing their voices as little ones was overwhelming to me. Like, you, you, there's things you forget. There's things you just move on and you forget how special that moment was, how tender that, that time was, that season was, how difficult that season was. We just forget. Or we remember little pieces, seeing their faces, hearing their voices. You know, at the time, I think as a parent, when you're in the midst of the little one stage, you, I, I remember telling my wife, I don't want to have to record everything. I got tired of it, you know. But now I wish we had more. Now I wish we could go back and relive it and to remember it. Watching those videos has been good for my soul. It put me back in touch with some things that I had forgotten. And that really is an important spiritual discipline for us. The discipline of remembering. Because we forget things. The sheer joy of childhood, the amazing gratitude of being a father. What a wonderful mother my, mother my wife is. And life moves by so quickly. And the tyranny of the now, the present moment, can take away things that we need to remember and to hold on to. We forget so easily. Frederick Buechner wrote a book called A Room Called Remember. He's a, is one of Pastor Brian's favorite authors, and I love him as well. Let me read you a couple excerpts from his book, A Room Called Remember. He says, a scrap of some song that was popular years ago, a book we read as a child, a stretch of road we used to travel, an old photograph, an old letter, there's no telling what trivial thing may do it. And then suddenly, there it is something that has happened to us once and is there, not just as a picture on the wall to stand back from and gaze at, but as a reality we are so much a part of still, and that is still so much a part of us, that we feel with something close to its original intensity 
and freshness. He goes on. The kind of memories I have being naming, uh, been naming are memories that come and go more or less on their own, apart from any choice of ours. Things that remind us, and the power is the things, not ours. The room called remember, on the other hand, is a room we can enter whenever we like, so the power of remembering becomes our own power. What he's saying is this, sometimes memories catch you off guard. You don't see them coming. But there's a discipline, a, a room called remember, a way that we enter back into that which we have forgotten. And that's what I want to talk to you about. We are fundamentally spiritually forgetful people. We are, this is true about us. It's not just true about us in terms of our family life or our you know, childhood. We are spiritually forgetful people. The Bible is clear about this. Isaiah chapter 17, verse 10, tells us this. You have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, though you plant pleasant plants and sow the vine branch of a stranger, he's saying what we've forgotten and not remembered is who God is. That we have not remembered who he is. God's people then, and that's true now. We forget. Part of what we do when we come to worship, whether online or in person, is we collectively remember. We, we wake up again to the reality of who God is and who we are. And that's something we need to do frequently, daily, moment by moment, every day. We're all of us, in one way or another, forgetful people. Some folks will tell me, you know, Pastor Jeff, you must have a photographic memory because I can remember things that I read really well. But if you ask my wife, she'll tell you that is not true. I have a selectively good memory. I can remember C.S. Lewis quotes, movie lines, and things that I read from long ago. I can remember where they are on the page in a book, but I cannot remember what my wife told me yesterday, when to be home, who to pick up, and what we agreed on. <laughs> so all of us are forgetful people in different ways. And the Bible tells us that part of our, our spiritual growth is learning to recall who God is and who we are in light of his mercy and grace. This was a constant theme in the history of Israel in the Old Testament, and it's a constant theme in our day as well. In fact, there's a book of the Bible, you may not know this, there's an entire book of the Bible dedicated to helping God's people remember. Do you know what it is? It's the book of Deuteronomy. Literally, the word means second law, uh, and it's a, it's a book of remembering the law, the words of God, his way of life, again, for God's people, because, as, as we're going to read, they forget. We forget. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse, a few selected verses. 11 through 14. Take care. Here it is. We'll make a couple of highlights here in this passage, which is important for us. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. So specifically, we forget by not obeying. When we walk in the commandments of God, we naturally remember God. When we start, stop walking in God's commandments, we start to forget who God is. There's a key connection between our obedience and our ability to remember who God is. And his rules and his statutes which I have commanded you today. Lest, here's this important, lest, what happens? When you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and what? And you forget the Lord your God. May it never be of us. This is fascinating. Two things cause us to forget. Lack of obedience and prosperity. When everything's going great and we're doing our own thing, we're prone to forget who God is. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. It's a stern warning here to God's people then. And we see the history of Israel, what actually happens. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God. Lest by lack of obedience, by prosperity, comfort, and ease of life. Now, I don't know all of you, but for many of us living in the Chicagoland suburbs, prosperity, comfort, ease of life, security. You may not think of your life that way, but on the world's in comparison to the world's economy and the way the world operates, we have a very comfortable, secure, and easy life. And there's a spiritual danger in that, that we would forget who God is.
You see, a new generation of Israelites was about to enter the promised land in Deuteronomy 8. And after 40 years in the wilderness, this generation had not witnessed some of the things their ancestors, their, fa their mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers had seen. They didn't see it firsthand, and they were prone to forget. The miracle of the Red Sea, or heard the law given at Sinai, the most important thing, this is key, as they're about to enter into the long-awaited promised land, the most important thing is they don't forget God. That's key. They remember him through his word. The word in Hebrew for remember is the word zakar. It, it occurs 286 times uh, in the Old Testament. We see it again and again and again. In fact, the word itself means to see again. To see again. And that's a great way to think about remembering. When I saw those videos of my children, I saw again, not just with my eyes, but with my heart. Oh, I remember. I see again how precious that was. When we spiritually remember, we see again the glory and beauty and majesty of who God is. Because we forget. We lose sight. We question. We doubt. In biblical terms, to remember is not just to recall past events then. Oh yeah, remember that thing happened? That's not what remem remembering is. It is actually to do something. Not just reminiscing about days gone by, but doing something. To take some action on that which you have seen again remembered. Deuteronomy 8.11 says, Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. So our taking care leads to obedience. So it's not just a stroll down memory lane. I, I sometimes, when we drive back to, uh, my, to Crystal Lake, the town I grew up in, we'll drive by our old house and remember, oh, remember that? Remember when we did that? That doesn't necessarily change my life. It's a fun, you know, intel mental exercise, but it doesn't change me. Spiritual remembering is meant to change us and to lead us to obedience in the present. Okay, so to forget God is to stop living a certain way in obedience to his word and trusting in his will. Likewise, to remember God is to start living in a certain way again. That's why we recall and see again. We have a deep need to remember. We have a deep spiritual need to remember. This is true about us fundamentally. Even for those who would say that they don't believe in God or they question God or doubt him altogether, the truth is, if we are made in God's image, if Ecclesiastes 3.11 is true that God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women, but we have not understood what he's done from beginning to end, that means we have a spiritual need to remember God, even with that, to come to believe in him the first time is a way of waking up and remembering who we were created to be. This may sound simple and obvious, but then again, if we're forgetful people, sometimes the most simple and obvious things need to be repeated. When I was an athlete in high school and in college, one of the key things you learned as an athlete in football and in wrestling was repetition. Repetition, 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 over and over and over again. Run the same play, do the same drill. Why? You're training your body, your muscle memory, we call it, to do something out of memory in a, in a moment of stress and anxiety or, or difficulty. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. We discipline ourselves to remember. When, it, when we're tested, when we're tempted, when life gets hard, we're conditioned to remember, I, I know who God is. I see again who he is, that his word is true. Um, my kids, when they were little, and I would tuck them into bed, I've told this story before, I would ask them three questions every night. And we had this little routine. I would say, who loves you more than the whole wide world? And the answer was mommy and daddy. Taught them the answer, of course. Who loves you even more than that? The answer is God. And what's the most important thing in your whole life? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want my children every night to know mom and dad love you more than the world. And God loves you infinitely more. And the most important thing in your life is to love God and love people. So I'd ask them the same three questions every night. And every night they give the answers, right? Repetition, why? So they remember. So it gets ingrained into who they are. Why did I do that to them? The same reason we're told in Deuteronomy, to remember. You might forget what you learned in trigonometry. You might forget the names of some of your fifth grade classmates. You, your locker combination, I could never remember those, right? You, you, where you left your keys or what you had, had for Christmas dinner last year or what the presents you got you know, a couple years ago or gave, those things might slip out of your memory. But don't ever forget the Lord your God. Don't ever forget the one who made you in his image, who loves you infinitely with an everlasting love, who sent his son into this world as a baby to live and die in your place to give you hope for eternity. Never forget that. I remember my, uh, from my Scottish roots, hearing an old Scottish man say, don't forget where you come from, lad, and don't forget where you're going, right? Don't forget who you are, whose you are. 
Again, Frederick Buechner's book, A Room Called Remembering, talks about this theme that remembering is powerful and it doesn't have to be random. It's a discipline we can employ. We can enter the room called remember, spiritually speaking, by going to the Word of God, by reading His Word and being reminded, by telling ourselves what I feel in this moment is not necessarily reality, but what the Word of God says is reality. We can do that for ourselves. We can actively choose to remember. But as Christians... What specifically is it we're called to remember? Just like the Israelites, we're called to remember God, His Word, remember who He is and what He's done. First Chronicles chapter 16 tells us, Seek the Lord in His strength, seek His presence continually, remember His wondrous works that He has done, His miracles and the judgments that He uttered. That's crucial. Well, what is the most wondrous thing that our God has done? If we're supposed to remember his strength, seek his presence, remember his wondrous works and the miracles. Think about that for just a minute. Remembering his strength, the wondrous works and his miracles and the judgments. Well, for a moment, let's just think for a second. What's the most wonderful thing God has done? A little hint. We just celebrated it <laughs> one day ago, right? The incarnation, that the God of the universe would come into our world, take on flesh, that we have seen his glory of the uh, glory of the God, the Father, the one and only, in the flesh of the Son, Jesus Christ. That he is the exact imprint of the, of the image of the invisible God. The representative of, that's how, that's how we know who God is and what he's like, through the living word made flesh. He came to us, to our world. So as, as followers of Jesus, the main thing we do is we remember Jesus. Not just once upon a time when baby in the manger, we put that manger scene away, but every moment of every day of our lives, we call to mind and see again the beauty and the glory and the majesty and the power of Jesus and of his grace. Okay, so how do we remember well, this is a big part of, I said, of what worship is about when we worship. And, and by the way, worship is not just gathering together once a week to sing songs. You worship in your car, driving down, listening to a worship song. You worship in your, the quietness of your own heart in the morning when you get up. You worship. Your whole life is meant to be an act of worship. But when we enter into collectively corporate worship together as God's people, we are remembering. We are seeing again through word preached, word read, and through songs sung who God is, who Jesus is, and his glories. Christians have been engaging in a, a host of activities to help them remember, singing, reading, saying, art, private devotion, a number of things. But I want to focus on one particular method of remembering, one discipline we can employ. We must continually remind each other. So remembering is not just something you do for yourself. We think of sometimes remember as a spiritual exercise, like a, uh, like a meditation. We go into our own little, our own mind, our own memories, and that's true. But actually, you have an important role to play in somebody else remembering and seeing again who God is. We must continually remind each other spiritually. Let me explain this to you in the book of 2 Peter, where we studied this a couple of months ago as a church family. But 2 Peter, Peter is, when you read this verse with me, you're going to think Peter is a good friend to have. Listen to what he says. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Pause there for a minute. He says, I'm always going to remind you, even though you know this. Now, how many times have you thought, well, I shouldn't say anything because I know they know this. Who am I? They know more than I do. I, don't, I mean, Peter says, I don't care if you know. I don't care if you've heard it all your life. I'm never going to stop reminding you. I'm always going to remind you. As a matter of fact, he goes on. He says that he's going to stir us up by way of reminder. I think it's right, as long as I live in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. I love that phrase. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. It means he knows he's going to die. As soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may, may be able at any time to recall these things. What things? The things of the gospel. The things of Jesus Christ. Of who he is. What a great passage. 
Peter says, I'll never stop reminding you. My whole life is meant to be a spiritual reminder to you. The way that I live and the words that I speak, I want to remind you of who God is. As a matter of fact, I know that I'm not going to live very long. And even after I'm gone, I want my life to serve as a reminder to you. So you'll always be able to remember these things. What a great friend to have. And here's the message. You can be that kind of friend to somebody too. So can I. We have that role that Peter is describing in each other's lives. To be spiritual reminders. With our words of encouragement, our words of challenge, our words of confrontation sometimes. Peter freely admits that he's not telling them anything new. He's not giving them new insight, new information they've never heard before. He's reminding them of something they've forgotten so they can see again the goodness of God. And that phrase, stir you up, by way of reminder, we get sedentary. We get stuck. We, get, uh, we, we stop moving in the direction God has called us. And we need to be stirred up. That's a great phrase. It captures precisely what is so powerful about remembering. The Greek word is, is a compound word, hupo mimensko, mimnesko, excuse me. It means to bring, uh, to bring under, uh, bring to mind under again. Hupo meaning under, bring to mind. So to bring to mind, bring yourself under the remembering of who God is again. To bring your mind, your body, your life back underneath the memory and the reality and the truth of who God is and to help someone else do the same. Literally, to bring your mind under a particular truth. Notice also, Peter is not like a, he's not like a frustrated parent here. He's not saying, how many times do I have to tell you, you kids, I've told you this time and time again, right? <laughs> Maybe your parents said that to you, like I've said that to my kids sometimes. That's not, that's not the tone. He seems to consider it a privilege, a joy, a, a, a purpose of his life to be a reminder, to help people remember. So when it comes to reminding a friend of some aspect of God's truth, how often do we think, well, who am I? I'm, I'm not telling them anything new. Or I, I screw this up too. Yeah, so? We all need it. You're depriving them. And you know what I found? When I take the prayerful time to think about who needs a reminder of my life and to step out in faith and try to remind them with a word of encouragement, sharing scripture or whatever it is, or calling them or texting them, you know what, I, what happens to me? I'm reminded. I'm stirred up as well, and so are you. Peter says basically, as long as I'm alive and able to speak, or able to write, or draw breath, I'm going to keep reminding you. You ever get around somebody and they can't stop talking about something? Maybe, maybe you have that relative who is all politics all the time, and they go, oh, here he goes again, talking about whatever it is, or their thing. Some, sometimes people have their thing, and they can't, they can't, every conversation leads to COVID, maybe, you know, or to some discussion about that. What would it be like if we were the kind of people who just couldn't stop talking about the love of God? We just couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Like every conversation somehow finds its way to him because he's the center of our lives. That's the kind of person I want to be. Do you? I want to be a living reminder. I want you to be that way and us for each other. Let me give you a couple examples of what this might look like. Um, we had a pastor on our staff named Roger Kreitz. Many of you might know him. Some of you never met him. He's with the Lord Jesus now. He died of cancer. But this is many years ago. Uh, he used to walk around uh, our office saying, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And he would particularly say this after a difficult situation. Somebody, uh, some tense conversation, some bit of bad news. He'd make a point of walking around saying that. And so I have to be honest, sometimes I rolled my eyes. But I think back on that now, I, how I needed that. He wasn't being trite or trying to be funny. He was being s very sincere. This is the day the Lord has made, every day. Let's rejoice and be glad in it, from Psalm 118. He wasn't just being pastoral, maybe. I'm not the only one who remembers that. Many years ago, I worked in a youth ministry with a guy who was always saying, Jesus loves you and God is in control. It became like a joke, running joke. Jesus loves you, and here comes Greg. Jesus loves you. God's in control. Yeah, we know. But what great things to remind people of. Uh, I, I know a, a guy named Matt on our, uh, uh, who's a member of our church, sometimes plays in our worship band. And he'll say to me sometimes after a worship service, he'll just look at me and say, he loves us, Pastor Jeff. He really loves us. It's a reminder. It's true. And he's not saying that because he thinks that I don't know, but it's coming out of who he is, stirring me up by way of reminder by the love of God. You can do that for people. You should do that for people. You must do that for people, and so must I, and you need that as well. It was precisely the reminder that we needed at every moment is when, and I'll, I'll tell you one little story. Um, 
we were in a staff meeting, um, and um, this particular man who said, Jesus loves you and God is in control, um, we're talking about an individual who's uh, went through a very, very painful time in, in their life. Uh, their marriage was in disarray, and it was just really hard. We're praying with this individual. And this, this friend of mine looked up at, at them and said through tears, Jesus loves you, and God is in control. It's a line I'd heard him say a thousand times before, but somehow in that moment it felt exactly the right thing to say at that moment. That individual needed to hear it. Every good teacher knows that the one universal fact, their students are going to forget what's, what's taught them. In fact, I know this you will not remember much of this sermon. In a, in a, in a, in a, probably before the end of the day, maybe tomorrow, you're going to remember a, a few things, right? I hope you remember the love of God communicated to you in His Word, whatever I say, and that that lives in your heart, and you remember the words of Peter, to be stirred up by way of reminder. Each time you access stored information mentally, you, you make it easier to remember. You bring it back. It stays closer to the forefront of your mind and your heart. Uh, so you improve your capacity to recall it in the future. The more you use something, the greater its power, right? So that's why repetition matters in, in athletics and in our spiritual lives. That's why we go to the Word of God again and again and again. If you've had the experience, you read something in God's Word you've read a hundred times or ten times or twenty times before, and it comes alive to you in a way you never saw it, it's fresh, it's new, you never saw it that way before, what's happening? Has the Word changed? No, it hasn't. Perhaps you have. Maybe you're open and more ready to hear it in a new way. But it's the rep repetition that matters. That's why we memorize Scripture. I'm in a group of men that we memorize Scripture. Our memories are getting worse. It's harder to do, you know. But the reason we do it is not for the performance of reciting it, but in order to remem remember it, to, to memorize it, I have to repeat it over and over and over again. And then it gets inside me. Then it gets from my mind into my heart. It becomes part of who I am. So... I, very soon, a week or so, we'll be at a new year. Hard to believe that. I'm not sure what to think about. I've, I've, stopped, I've stopped hoping for certain things. I'm just trusting God with whatever comes in the new year. I don't know how you feel about New Year's resolutions, but I'm going to give you two questions, maybe two challenges in the form of questions, to think about not just now or in the new year, but in your life as a follower of Jesus. Here's the questions. Question number one. Where in your life do you need a spiritual reminder? Maybe you picked up uh, one of the uh, Chapel Street journals and you've been journaling your way through that or starting to. Or maybe you want to start journaling. That's a great question to start with. God, what do, I need, what do you want to remind me of? What aspect of your character? What aspect of your nature? What part of the gospel have I forgotten or am starting to doubt? And I need us to be stirred up in reminder. So that's a, for question number one. Question number two. Who in your life needs a spiritual reminder? Maybe it's... Uh, one of your children, your spouse, a good family member who don't, you don't see as often anymore. I, I talked to a good brother uh, who's a brother in the Lord of mine, uh, and we're, we used to be in a group together, but now we're in different groups, and we don't connect as often. And I was just reminded in our inter interactions how much I love that guy, how much I care about him, how important he is to me. And, um, and, he, and even though we don't interact and have the time and proximity, he still matters, and I want to stir him up by way of reminder. I want the same from him. So I want to encourage you, in your life, where do you need a spiritual reminder? And who needs a spiritual reminder from you? God wants to give you that so that you never forget how much he loves you. Let's pray. Father, we confess to you that we are forgetful people. We're prone to wander. We feel that as we sing in the hymn. And in this moment, we want to pause and remember and see again your goodness and beauty and grace and love through your son, Jesus. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would stir each of us up by way of reminder, that you would bring to mind not only the glory of your gospel in our hearts, but also those people in our lives who need us to remind them. What a great privilege it is to do what Peter calls us to do, to never stop reminding each other of who you are. As long as we have breath, to stir one another up by way of reminder so that we might know you and obey you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. So today's benediction is from 1 Chronicles 16, 11, and 12. Let me read. Seek the Lord and his strength. 
Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Bless you, church, and I'll see you next year.